There are many roads to one's final destination. The passion that drives us, the choices we make, the friends and family we choose to stay with or sometimes leave behind in search of our own destiny. They all play a significant role in the roads we drive down. And while we all know where we come from and where we'll ultimately end up, the only question that really matters is, why are we here? That's been the torment of scholars, philosophers, and priests for centuries, and mostly because the rest of us keep nagging them for an answer. But ultimately, the truth that applies to most everyone is out there. And sometimes you have to go in search of it. Philosophy aside, you didn't really think this was about a shirtless, beer-drinking fatso wearing a funny foam hat in sub-zero weather, did you? Well, there's a bit of that too. Wisconsin is an average-sized state with a big personality. Admitted into the Union as the 30th state in 1848, the state animal is the badger. No, not that one. It's the other one. With a population of one deer for roughly every six humans in the state, you can easily guess what the state wildlife animal is. And we love to hunt them. As to the state's domesticated animal? Nope. Not a cute little puppy. It's the cow. And rightly so. Nearly one-fourth of the state's economy depends on cows. The state drink? Well, the state's website would say it's milk. Most Wisconsinites, however, would argue that it's beer. State food? <laughs> well, everybody knows what that is. And the state mascot? Well, there's a few of those. Bucky Badger, Bernie Brewer, the Muskie, the cow in any form, and of course the cheesehead. Not just the funny foam hat, mind you. A cheesehead is much more than that. So what exactly is a cheesehead? Well, that's what you're about to find out. In the case of this cheesehead's journey, it all began with tailgating the Badgers at the Rose Bowl. Wisconsin fans showed up in droves. The sea of red expanded as far as I could see. Kind of like pack animals with beer. Tailgating professionals who could travel well. Go Bucky! I'm a cheesehead, baby! I love it! I'm a cheesehead! That experience, it was like a drug. Man, did I need more. So how do you top that? Tailgating the Packers at the Super Bowl in Texas, where Cheesehead Nation was showing its pride, and they graciously brought the tundra with them. Invigorating. Yeah, this is some Texas for you, right? <laughs> That's right. You'd think we were back in Green Bay with this kind of ice on the road. I bleed green and gold. I wear it every day. <laughs> I wear my heart on my sleeve. It's a real camaraderie. You know, really root for your team, enjoy the fans, you know, but root against the other team, but enjoy the whole ambiance, the whole tailgating, the fellowship of it. It's almost like a fraternity or a sorority, if you would. It's just like, a, I, don't, I don't want to use the word cult. <laughs> we drove all the way from Green Bay to Dallas, Texas with my Texas Cadillac. I'm a cheesehead. I, I was born this way. I love the Packers. Are you a cheesehead? Oh, I'm absolutely a cheesehead. I was born and raised in Wisconsin and uh, proud to wear of a cheese wedge. It's awesome. And then to be here at my first Super Bowl, and watch the Green Bay Packers win their 13th championship. I can't tell you how moving that is. Go Green Bay! It was time for Cheesehead Nation to celebrate. The Lombardi Trophy was going back where it belonged in Green Bay. After all, it's called Title Town USA for a reason. So where does the Cheesehead passion come from? The Packers, the Badgers, the Brewers? Sure, why not? But after these two amazing encounters, I knew it had to be much more than just sports love. After all, I was born in Wisconsin. I proudly called myself a cheesehead. But I also knew the hat was just a symbol of something much more interesting. So I set out on a journey to find the deeper meaning of being a cheesehead, and to see if Wisconsin was as special as I remembered it to be. Not only that, I was in desperate need of some fresh cheese curds. Of course, every cheesehead story has a beginning. And sometimes you just have to take a moment to stare up at the beauty of it all and wonder. There are moments when you catch a glimpse of something so profoundly beyond yourself 
that you become transfixed. Not for its beauty, or the understanding that such a moment has to offer, but for the moment itself in which your very existence becomes eternal. And then you remember to breathe. My first awareness of such a moment, well, I was in the church basement during preschool. I never could sleep at nap time, so I'd pretend to, and then stare up at the sunlight streaming in through a window, all the while wondering, how could something be so beautiful without even trying? As to the place where those kind of thoughts came to life, well, that was in your everyday small town in the great north woods of Wisconsin. It had your typical Main Street, that's pretty much the same today. An awesome water tower behind our house that sadly is no longer there. And plenty of woods to hide in when you wanted to be alone. That is, of course, until mom or dad yelled for you to come inside. Even then, the house I grew up in had lots of nooks and crannies to sneak off and read a book in. It was the kind of youthful experience that every good parent would want for their children. The kind of experience I was glad to have had. And of course, there's that training ground for your future self. You know, that shared exploration and seeming futility. We've all lived it. A first crush and the inevitable heartbreak to follow. Fumbling through friendships, wanting to fit in, learning to lose. It's about the excitement of discovery, acceptance, and perhaps rejection. Desperately reaching for an identity so you can feel comfortable in your own skin. And ultimately, hopefully, finding yourself. Of course, my most pronounced childhood memories seem to involve the Green Bay Packers an awful lot. Watching them on TV with my family. Listening to the radio with my brother as the Polish prince ran in a blocked field goal for a touchdown to defeat the Bears. The time I finally got to meet the legendary Bart Starr. <laughs> Man, was that inspiring. Like every teenage boy in Wisconsin, I wanted to be a Green Bay Packer. But I was puny and terrible at football. Even so, it reinforced an important mindset that stayed with me. Effort, teamwork, and passion. As to the term she said, yeah, it was there. But it certainly didn't mean the same thing then that it does today. Whatever that is. According to the Oxford Dictionary, a cheesehead is, one, a resident of Wisconsin, especially a fan of the Green Bay Packers football team, so-called because Wisconsin is noted for the production of cheese. Duh. Two, a blockhead. An idiot. Yeah, that's what the fibs think. Douchebags. And three, in the British vernacular, a type of screw head with vertical sides and a slightly domed top. <laughs> yeah, you didn't see that last one coming, did you? Wait, why are we still typing on screen? Hey, stop that. So how do you get to the profound nature of a term that, on its face, seems like nothing more than a pejorative towards Wisconsin sports fans? Simple. Find a bunch of word nerds and see what they had to say. One of the stories is, I'm not sure that's true, but um, is that that Illinois people at White Sox games started calling us cheeseheads and it was it was derogatory. Oh, come on, Nero. What cheesehead would wear a ton of toxic poisons on his skin for six hours? You have to trace this back to just head. Yeah. You know, so the dead heads, acid heads, you yes. know, head as a term for like a subcultural okay. unit. You know, was, well, it, was it at least in the late 50s? Probably the cheesehead tradition dates back to the French voyagers who talked about the tête de fromage uh, in their in their bateau. I never heard the, the term cheesehead uh, until you know until the early 1980s. The first use of the cheesehead was in 1888. Uh, the second one was in 1907, and so that would account for the first beginning of that uh, rise in use of cheesehead. But then the first spikes would be due to. Uh, probably due to Wisconsin. Between the 60s and, and 80s, around the 70s, uh, there's a big spike. And then there's uh, a second spike, which is more recently in 2000. That second spike would be due to uh, some of the success of yeah. Yeah, Packers. And it's an advertisement. To you, that just fits right in with all of these other words. It's just one of many. It's one of many meanings for cheese heads, actually. So the term had to precede the object, because basically the object was 
crafted out of the concept of cheeseheads. What we have found cheesehead means is one of several things. It can be the foam triangle that you can wear, a Packers fan, or it can simply be a Wisconsinite. It's not a stretch to associate cheese with Wisconsin and then you know, someone who's really into Wisconsin, yeah, he's a cheesehead. And they're always a stinking cheesehead because they don't like those people from Wisconsin. It's not only used by people in Wisconsin, but it's used by people outside Wisconsin where they want to uh, uh, cast aspersions on people from, from Wisconsin. Almost all the great, you know, icons start out as insults. We may call people from Illinois fibs, uh, <laughs> which I won't explain on, on camera, but... The bad side of this is that I think this is the general source of, like, a lot of what prejudice is, is, you know, just allowing your brain to spout forth these negative judgments without taking a step back and asking, like, hold on, where did this come from? Museum of Tolerance? Oh, oh man, geez. that made you think. You know, one group calling another group in a disparaging term, I guess common for the for the one group to, to reclaim it. All right, let's manufacture cheeseheads and put them on our heads. Let's embrace cheesehead. Let's be proud of the cheesehead. And I think that takes a certain kind of sophistication. The first people to make cheeseheads in their homes and wear them in defiance of the derogatory comments by those flatlanders down there, uh, those people took the image, the icon, the symbol, and they turned it on its head. I will embrace that, and I will show so many more dimensions uh, to being the thing you think that I am. The folklorist Jim Leary uh, has uh, talked about Wisconsin before. Every, wherever you are is the center of the universe. I think there is something to this, this sense of place, and I think being a cheesehead uh, represents the sense of place. Yeah, I think we'll have the word cheesehead for a long time people have really bought into it. it. It makes you feel at home, it makes you feel like you belong, which is hugely important. People are aware that there is a cultural entity of the Midwest, and there is a Wisconsin cultural identity. It's being proud of where you're from. As to those aforementioned cheese curds, well, every time I came back to Wisconsin over the years, one of the first things I always did was find my favorite bag of fresh cheese curds and enjoy. They are a wonderful treat that can only be found mostly in Wisconsin. Why? Because we like to keep the good stuff to ourselves. Musical curds, because they squeak. Cheese curd nirvana. Believe me, it's worth a trip to Wisconsin. We had some of your family or friends come up and I was like, I asked them, I was like, guys, you guys want some cheese curds? And they're like, what's a cheese curd? And I was, I don't know, I think I was almost heartbroken. Cheese curds seem to be a unique thing just in Wisconsin. Cheese curds are a perfect example of, of regional preference. Cheese curds are fun because they squeak. And it actually squeaks when you chew it. These cheese curds were so fresh, so warm, so squeaky. We put in so many mice per batch just to get that right amount of squeaks. So you'll have to figure that one out. We always say that if they don't squeak, they're not real curds. They gotta squeak. That is the one thing that everybody loves about curds. Nothing to do with mice, though. No, no, nothing at all. Once you open that bottle of fine wine, you've only got so many days to actually drink that bottle before it, it just loses its taste and loses its flavor. So to, to ship it or to consume it somewhere else after two, three weeks, it's not the same. We do can maybe get carried away with our cheese curd, but we love them, so we deep fry them. Deep fried cheese curds, yes. When we opened two restaurants in Tucson, Arizona, every single order had cheese curds on them. I don't know if these people knew what they were or not, but it was so fun. See, I couldn't believe it. Keep the cheese curds coming. Are there people who don't love cheese curds? So lactose and lactose lactose and oh, oh, yeah, okay. You people are crazy. <laughs> Making a movie about cheese curds? And the vast majority of the people in the world don't know the pleasure of a fresh Wisconsin cheese curd. And they, they need to have that. We are the cheese curd capital of Wisconsin. We were proclaimed that by Governor Earl. This bag just got full of milk. Nice. This one they're starting to cook up. Once it gets solidified, they start the cutting process. Cheese is pumped over onto this belt. By the time we get downstairs, it's being cut. And all the way, you can see it's draining off right here. Wow, that's what it goes on forever. Oh, yeah. Just that little break in between there is a different bat coming. That's the difference between our shirt and our other shirt. It may be the same as that, three inches, but three quarters of an inch. In essence, that is going to be the final product in a matter of minutes. Just the salting uh, procedure yet, yeah, that's it. This whole machine is a salting machine. There's three different applications of salt. You can see the cheese coming down. <laughs> <laughs> He's all flogged up. So our curds go 
going to 500 pound barrel. Those are resold to other processors. Each vertical is a, is a semi load of cheese that goes out that fits into a semi. It goes up to around 40,000 pounds. That's a lot of cheese. Is that the green and gold? Intentional? It wasn't. It was kind of funny. Why did the curd cross the street? To get out of the way. <laughs> Put on Paul. Curd Nirvana. Yeah. <laughs> John Mitchell is on quite a journey. He's, he's doing a documentary on Wisconsin cheesehead culture. The word cheesehead is broad, isn't it? It has so many different definitions, and the spirit of somebody who loves Wisconsin, is from Wisconsin, is of Wisconsin. What does it mean to you? We're digging under the hat to see what the psyche is all about. Ooh, I like that. Mere passive citizenship is not enough. Men must be aggressive. For what is right, if government is to be saved from those who are aggressive for what is wrong. Well, the Wisconsin idea uh, was, at the time, at the turn of the 20th century, a radical notion that a university, uh, and particularly one that's funded by taxpayers, not a private university, but a public one, should benefit everybody in the state. Uh, they often say the borders of the campus are the borders of the state. A, a lot of people were all newcomers together here in the state, and I think that helped shape that sense of you can't leave this group out when you talk about the we the people here. But that's part of Wisconsin, and let's face it, I mean, um, progressive movement, Marvel La Follette, uh, Hellraisers, reformers. Wisconsin has a long, long tradition of being a progressive state, of being a place that's very open and very tolerant and embraces new ideas and new ways to do things. The progressive tradition really began as a Republican tradition. Ripon, Wisconsin, which is the home of the uh, GOP, and Ripon Good Cookies. <laughs> <laughs> I have to try that one. You have to. <laughs> it was this philosophy of the Enlightenment that science, profits, markets, and education would make farmers the equal to his city cousin. There's definitely a lot of diversity in this state. You've, you've got you know, one of the major research universities in the world, and you've got an awful lot of dairy farmers. It really was a new idea in the world. And Wisconsin, in that era, really was the greatest exponent of what we now take as our progressive culture. But you don't have a Wisconsin state, like there's a Michigan state, and there's like an Iowa state, and. Other schools have these little rivalries going on. Not Wisconsin, there's no Wisconsin state. There's just Wisconsin. So everybody's got one big red sweater. Big red sweater in hand, metaphorically speaking, of course. I paid a visit to the Capitol building in Madison. And as I walked up to it, the thought that this was the people's building truly intrigued me. I was also enthralled by the statues of heroic women and the living one standing next to it. But I had some place to be. I had a meeting with the governor. And certainly the, the cheese head itself stands out, but the larger sense is who's underneath that. And uh, it's a great story to tell about who are Wisconsinites, who are the cheese heads, and uh, just phenomenal people. And I think a lot of times uh, folks here in the Midwest get overlooked. I once heard a, a joke that someone had about Wisconsin, but in a way it was a perfect way to, to put it. So you might be from Wisconsin. If you're in a, 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 a hardware store and um, someone asks you if you need help and they don't work there. In, in our state, the Packers for sure, but even uh, the, the Wisconsin Badgers and the Milwaukee Brewers uh, are teams that unite people no matter where they're from, no matter whether they're a Democrat or a Republican, whether they live in the city or on a farm. Those are things we share, common bonds. And uh, I said, throw in Harley Davidson, and those are all the kind of common denominators that doesn't matter whether you're a CEO or a janitor at the same company, everybody's cheering on the same cause. I always said people from Wisconsin are the kind of people anywhere in the world you'd want to have as your best friend or one of your close friends is someone from Wisconsin, because they're always going to be loyal, they're always going to look out for you, they're also going to treat you decently. And um, does everybody want someone like that around them? After interviewing the sitting governor, I journeyed through the building I'd heard so much about during my childhood, yet had never experienced firsthand back then. I had free reign to shoot around the building, so I did just that. It was a magical experience, the kind of intimacy one can only have with art, architecture, and history. I was enthralled, 
in love with Wisconsin all over again. This was Castle Cheesehead. This was home. Factories are easy to obsess over. I certainly do, having always seen it as its own form of artistry. And it's not just the products they make, but those magnificent Lynchian industrial complexes that spring up to make those things as well. They're like worlds under their own. And those factories, well, they're places where people go to work hard so that afterwards you have a damn good reason to play hard. So I trekked my way around some of the manufacturers in the state to see that Wisconsin work ethic in action. So manhole covers all over the country. You can find them in New York City to LA to Florida. The other 80% is industrial products that go into heavy duty trucks, go into large construction equipment, bulldozers, excavators, and uh, agricultural equipment. It's still a manufacturing based economy. Obviously, agricultural is very, agriculture is very important for the state. We started out being a lumber center. I think the close ties to anything in the wood related fields just feels like Wisconsin. Well, the Wisconsin Milk Marketing Board buys our boxes for promotion. Uh, they like to put them in the delis, and uh, we make barrels for the Wisconsin Milk Marketing Board. We make a lot of barrels, and we'll silk screen the name of the store on the barrel, and also Wisconsin Milk Marketing logo. And they'll use them for promotions, they'll cut cheese on them, they'll display on them to push Wisconsin cheese. Most people know that Wisconsin is known for cheese, obviously, but Wisconsin is also the number one paper making state in the United States. And we make the most recycled paper. Once we've taken the fiber, we've colored it, we've got it ready to make paper out of it, we're going to add a lot of water. And now we're going to make a sheet of paper out of it. Now we're going to determine how smooth we want to make that paper by going through either one or several nips. So after the paper's been cut, it is stacked and it's ready to go. The Wisconsin uh, workers, I mean, they love their brewers, they love their packers, they like to play hard. But the work ethic here at this mill and throughout Wisconsin is really second to none. It's a combination of a very strong work ethic and also a very high level of craftsmanship here. You know, this is a very sophisticated tool on wheels. And uh, we have guys that have been here 30, 40 years. It's much more than just coming to work. It's uh, really part of your life. Well, MacArthur Talon Sports has been in business since 1885. Um, I'm actually the sixth generation to be a part of the family business. And we sell all of the rally towels, the trophy towel, the beach towels that you see with all the professional sports logos on them. The people we have that work for the company are just the salt of the earth. They take pride in what they do. And whatever they say they do, you can depend upon it. I don't care what job you have in our company, they have a good work ethic. They work hard, they give you 70 minutes for every hour they're there. The work ethic in the Midwest, and as typified by people here in Wisconsin, are superb. They are among the best in the world in terms of thought process, engagement. One of the great things about Wisconsin, I think people work really hard, but they do it so that they can play hard too, which is fun. The weekends we live for our sports and we have a great time here in Wisconsin and we work hard during the week and it all evens out nicely. Work is play for us in a lot of ways. As to the play hard side of things, we cheeseheads have repeatedly proven that we can do that better than anyone. The fact that we have a badger as our state animal, you know, that's a pretty badass animal. I've always been a big badger fan. Cross country. Curling. Volleyball. Men's hockey is very big here. Hockey. Badger women hockey have done very well, won the national title. They're like fifth in a row or something ridiculous like that. Anything badger. A team that wins, it just becomes, a, you know, a nexus for like, you know, awesome energy. I don't know if the same is true at the University of Texas or Oklahoma or Nebraska, but it's sure a phenomena here, this uh, 
tribalism of Wisconsin. It's amazing how many people come up to me and, and say, this is the greatest thing ever. You know, they really enjoy being able to see Bucky and the band performing here in Chicago. Named after Wisconsin legend and NFL Hall of Famer Elroy Crazy Legs Hirsch. The Crazy Legs Classic Race to support UW Athletics ends inside Camp Randall Stadium. And Perchies as usual, there's beer waiting for you past the finish line. Special thank you to all of today's sponsors. Yeah, we have an exceptional band. Mike LeCrone's just done a wonderful job. Uh, started that fifth quarter. Just a party. Just another way to go and listen to the band. And, and it's what's amazing is how many people stay and hang out for. Let's get a fifth quarter attitude. A cheesehead isn't our only mascot. We got a badger named Bucky to love as well. And doing the polka dance? Everybody loves to do the polka dance here. It sure is fun to love Bucky. No, I wasn't stalking Bucky. Is any merry? Let him sing songs. Let the Lord hear you sing and have the joy in your heart. Throughout my youth, I was obsessed with the idea of radio, likely brought about by my dad having his own weekly sermon broadcast on a local station. Yet I think it also grew out of something even bigger, you know, how radio reaches the masses in a way no other technology had prior to then. You could be anywhere, and the radio was available to you. More importantly, it was about people communicating with people. In my case, I was especially fond of Wisconsin Public Radio. I still am. I even have the app on my phone. 9XM talking, Department of Physics, University of Wisconsin. Please stand by. That was his original. That's the original ID they used. Nine for the Midwestern part of the U.S., X for Experimental, and M for Madison. Uh, it became WHAAM, which is the flagship station of Wisconsin Public Radio. It wasn't the first radio signal, but the public radio station in Wisconsin is the oldest one still in operation. There's a historical marker from the State Historical Society that's bolted to the side of the building that says it's the oldest station in the nation. My research in the book seems to say they're second oldest. The earliest claim that WHA has to broadcasting to the public was 11 a.m. on December 4th, 1916. Now, broadcasting as a word existed before radio. It's an agricultural term. If you look at a dictionary from 1880, the word broadcasting's in there. It means to scatter seeds. And at the University of Wisconsin, uh, they immediately thought, well, with this Wisconsin idea going, what can we do with this radio technology to benefit everyone? And the first thing they settled on was the weather forecast. They figured everybody could use that. So there was a, a real sense of connectedness that you got from the radio. And this started uh, at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. To show you how unimportant NFL football was in 1933, there were only three radio stations in Wisconsin that carried the Packers. WTMJ in Milwaukee, uh, there was a station in La Crosse, and this non-commercial station in Stevens Point. And most people hadn't seen a game. So when you did it on the radio, they, people have no visual sense in their head of what the game looks like. And I think that's another kind of Wisconsin-y thing. You, you'll get, uh, you know, you'll get these broadcasters that will get associated with the Packers or the Brewers. Uh, as another example, I mean, Euchre's been with the Brewers forever. There is a loyalty, I think. There's that Wisconsin sense of being you don't really want to go anywhere else. You just kind of like what you have, and you, I think that's part of the, the aesthetic here, too. With my youthful love of radio came a whole new understanding of the world of music. iTunes didn't exist back then. Even CDs were barely a thing. Yet my love of music was a borderline obsession. So looking into Les Paul was a no-brainer. After all, the world of sound and music that we know today would never have existed without the many Les Paul inventions that I found at Discovery World in Milwaukee. Need I say more? Well, actually, no. We'll, we'll let this guy do that. He's an expert. Les was the kind of guy who, when the light went on, he didn't just care that the light went on. He wasn't satisfied or happy when that light went on. He wanted to know what happened there. The only major technological change when it comes to uh, guitars in the last 75 years was really the movement from hollow body to solid body. To take a regular hollow bodied guitar here and do very different, very magical things by simply opening it up, tinkering it, using that same spirit of creativity and innovation that 
he received as a youth in Waukesha, Wisconsin, Les Paul number one. This is the first Gibson Les Paul that was ever created. And what Les did is he added a second recording head onto the, the tape recorder here, and he really introduced and ushered in the era of overdubbing. This was a quantum leap, the, going from recording on vinyl to recording on tape to overdubbing to Les's soundboard, to what Les uh, called the octopus and the eight track recorder. All of those were huge leaps in sound technology, and Les was at the forefront of every one of them. Everything about him was out in the open. People like Bing Crosby, the Andrews sisters, the Carpenters, the Fab Four, all of whom could take some of their inspiration and some of the innovation that they worked with and trace it back to work that Les had done throughout the years. A pretty amazing thing for a boy who grew up in suburban Milwaukee in Waukesha, Wisconsin to change the musical world forever. For non-aviophobics, well that would mean most of us, there's a splendor that comes with defying gravity like man had always dreamt of doing for the millennia before we actually could do it. How's that a cheesehead thing? <laughs> Oshkosh, AKA EAA, the Experimental Aircraft Association. Welcome to Oshkosh, Wisconsin, the home of EAA. We look at airports and go, boy, it's kind of a love-hate relationship sometimes, but between the wars, it was something that was glorious. It was first class all the way. It was an adventure. It was something that not everybody did. There was something almost romantic about air travel on a commercial side. And that same sense of romanticism continues today with the members of EAA who build and restore their aircraft, who may fly great military aircraft like the ones we're looking at here, or just continue to be passionate about aircraft, and that's what EAA is all about. And they all get together here each year for our annual convention, which becomes the world's largest fly-in. There are so many things that have come here to Oshkosh. In fact, if you go to any airport in the world and talk to a pilot next to his or her aircraft and saying, I'm going to talk to you about Oshkosh. They know exactly what you're going to talk about because it is the mecca of aviation. It's part air show, it's part trade show, it's part educational seminar, but the biggest part is family reunion. It's aviation's family reunion. And every year people get together, some 10,000 airplanes come to the region. Everything from the smallest ultralight all the way up to things such as the Airbus A380 or the Concorde has been to Oshkosh or the latest Boeing 747, 787s. They all come here because people here, we celebrate that fact, the joy, the fulfillment, the accomplishment, and the innovation that comes with that. Who's America's greatest architect? You know, again, it's hard to come up with uh, anyone who would rival Frank Lloyd Wright. When we talk about famous architects, um, usually I think we often put them in cities. Frank Lloyd Wright, rural Wisconsin, that's where he wanted to be. People call Frank Lloyd Wright, you know, Wisconsin's son. When you first encounter Frank Lloyd Wright, you think that they just tacked that label onto him because, oh, he lived here for so long. But when you really start to study his house and his whole estate, you start to realize, no, his blood, his self, you know, was tied to this landscape, to this area, to the people who lived here. I think it's important to say that since, you know, you're talking about place. Taliesin, his home, was also his incubator. So he started building it in 1911, but he never stopped. I think that interacting with the building here helps you to understand the man. He's talked about when he went to the Spring Green area to start to build Taliesin, how there was sort of a magnet pulling him there. He said later that nowhere else in the world do the hills so softly enfold you is here in southwestern Wisconsin. And Wright also said that the landscape around here was human scale, and his architecture is human scale. And I've come to believe that Wright's architecture would have been different had he not had such a close experience with this landscape. 
He was uh, definitely in love with the Taliesin Valley because of his Welsh heritage there. The word Taliesin is a Welsh word. It means the shining brow. He built Taliesin into the side of a hill, so it was part of the landscape, not on top of it, not trying to dominate it. It's one of the world's greatest architecture treasures, and it's right here in Wisconsin. And I just can't picture it any other place in the whole world. And he'll say later that Wisconsin soil put the sap in his veins. He calls himself a Wisconsin radical. There was no bigger fan of Wisconsin than Frank Lloyd Wright. I mean, he wrote an essay called Why I Love Wisconsin as an adult. That sounds like something a cute fourth grader would write. <laughs> I think he had a good sense of humor that most people don't pick up on. It was a very dry sense of humor. He had some funny thing to say about how he thought there should be a law passed that compelled every farmer to paint his barn red. He wasn't a control freak, though. No, he wasn't. <laughs> no, I think he understood the contradictions. He would talk about how he loved uh, Guernsey cows against the hillsides because they're this coffee-colored cow that looks it's the right color for the Green Hills, you know. Always the designer, always thinking about, oh, the colors are nice there. His blood, his self, you know, was tied to this landscape, to this area, to the people who lived here, and uh, helped to make him who he was, and he kept coming back. When I talk to visitors on the tour, and I am trying to convey how important Wisconsin was to Frank Lloyd Wright, I do use the word cheesehead. <laughs> It's just so funny to use that in, in conversation in Franklin Wright's living room. Jesus. After visiting Taliesin, how can you possibly top Frank Lloyd Wright? Well, you can't. But going from the world's greatest architect to quite possibly the world's strangest architect, Alex Jordan, House on the Rock was definitely a place I had to go. After all, it's loaded with a myriad of priceless collections. <laughs> Seriously, it's like the ultimate man cave. This is actually um, the rock that the house was built on and around. Yeah, it was like a pinnacle of rock that had come up and he had climbed up the rock to start um, building. Everywhere you turn, there's something new. There it is. And the local people could see him building it from the highway and they wanted to stop and see it. Well, he didn't really want it to be open to tourists. So he decided to charge them 50 cents a piece to scare them away. Hannibal crossing the Alps. I studied Hannibal's life for a long time. Oh, really? Uh, we're actually in uh, the world's only infinity room. It's 218 feet long, unsupported, and it has 3,264 windows that serve as walls. It's almost as though he's pointing it at something. Now that stone over there, is that also on your property? It's called percussion rock. Percussion rock? I'll bet you that pelts like crazy during rain. <laughs> no, I, I kind of joked when we first came in that this was sort of like the ultimate man cave. Is that a proper comparison, but on a much grander, more elaborate scale? Yeah, Alex Jordan loved to collect. Uh, he started out with the architecture in the original house. As he grew and as the attraction grew, he decided to add a lot of collections. It's now a complex of 17 buildings that you tour through if you see the whole tour. And you know, and there's really no rhyme or reason of a lot of the things he collected. He just enjoyed to collect unique things. House and Rock is full of unique things, um, from the infinity room that we're currently in to the world's largest carousel that has over 20,000 lights. If I fall over, catch me. We have a 200 foot long sea creature that's actually longer than what the Statue of Liberty is tall. We have one of the world's largest collection of antique dollhouses. We have a, a car collection and, and a modeled ship to collection and a lot of antique music machines. Ultimately, do you think he would have had a cheese head collection if he were around? <laughs> he probably would. I wouldn't be surprised if we would have had a, a display of that. <laughs> Thank you.
Curling, it's America's sport. <laughs> Okay, no. More like an Olympic sport that people love to make fun of. But I curled in high school, and I always thought it was complicatedly cool. It's somewhat of a zen battle on ice. So I took the opportunity at the U.S. Nationals Curling Championships in Portage to explain this little understood sport. Though I'm not so sure I succeeded. Wisconsin has more curling clubs than any other state. There are, I believe, around 32 to 33 curling clubs in Wisconsin. And you know what? It looks really easy, and it's not. It's frustrating. And I know why they give you that little broom-like thing, because you want to hit somebody by the time you're done. You say you're a curler, and people ask what it is, and they're like, oh, you know, that Olympic thing that you, you slide in the ice with those rocks, and, you know, so, but people really don't know about it. It's different around here because we're spoiled in Wisconsin. There's a fairly large contingent of uh, Scottish heritage, and they're the people that brought the game over. But anybody can curl, so there's open houses usually every fall in all the curling clubs. A bonspiel is the curling term for tournaments. The scoring you have to look at, the middle of the scoreboard is the score. The top and bottom are the colors, and in this case, there are two colors, red and yellow. So I'm a lead, I throw the first rocks, and you alternate back and forth with the other team. Now, the numbers you see hanging above and below are the end numbers. Your skip, who calls the game, he's kind of like the captain, um, will tell you where he wants the rock. And after everything is all the way down to the other end, you hang a score. So the skip will yell at you if he wants you to get that rock to go past another rock. It's a accumulation effect. So if they score three after the first end and they score two after the second end, they add on. And so it might be in front of the house, it might be in the house. They go on to the red bar line with the number one and hang it right below number three. A lot of times rocks will line up just the right way that you can bounce off one into another and take them both out. So. And that's how the scoring is. And it's really confusing, but after you look at for a while, it, it gets better. It's the curling Zamboni. In, in the winters are, you know, cold and long in Wisconsin, so curling just seems to kind of fit. All right, that really didn't clear anything up, but there really isn't a good explanation. It's just a lot of fun. Drawing a line from one world to another is, for any journey, consequential. You see the here, you see there, but you don't know what will happen in between. I took the Lake Express Ferry across Lake Michigan to test that theory. I was craving the solitude it might offer. This journey reminded me that the water is the life. Water is the truth. It's sometimes tumultuous, most times rather steady. I love to journey across water. Lucky for me. The captain even invited me on the bridge to see things from his vantage point. It's a place where you can see the curve of the earth. What is it about water in Wisconsin? Well, for one thing, we have a lot of it. Water purifies, renews, becomes. We transmit through water inside of us. A force of nature, yet calming all the same. Water is nature's magic. And a sunset on the waters of Lake Michigan. Well, that's just divine. The history of Wisconsin is intimately tied to water. You've got two great lakes to pretend are inland seas. And I think what a lot of people don't recognize, they think about the East Coast, they think about the West Coast, or maybe even the Gulf Coast. They don't think that we're sitting on America's fresh coast. We've got about 300 miles of shoreline here in Door County. Uh, not bad for a place in the Midwest. There are the biggest mass of water companies here than anywhere else, be they water heaters, water meters, uh, pipes flowing of water, all of those types of things grew up here because we've got 20% of the world's surface fresh water right at our fingertips, right outside our front door. We're the only state in the union that's surrounded by two great lakes, the greatest river in the U.S. See, we're filled with 15,000 lakes 
It's 5,000 more than the land of 10,000 lakes in Minnesota, and all of ours are filled with fish. Because of that unspoiled driftless region, we have spring creeks and we have river valleys and fly fishing and stuff that you think you have to go off to New England to get, and you, you got it here in Wisconsin. Over the years, every summer, we have the Monaco Bat Water Ski Show. It's the amateur show that's been going on longer than any other water ski show in the United States, and it's put on, it's put on by kids. And if you really like having surf come in, well, you know, go up to, to Bayfield or, uh, you know, some parts of the raw shore up there on a stormy day, and, you know, everything you'd find at Big Sur, you've got there. There's so much history here, the lighthouses, the shipwrecks. And in some places in the state, the connection is almost spiritual with the Native American uh, tribes. There is a spiritual connection to the water. And I think all of us have some inherent appreciation, connection to the water, whether we grew up fishing or boating, all of those things are made so much easier by the fact that we live on this huge body of water and all the inland lakes and streams. So all of those things give us opportunities to make a connection with that water. And that's how we identify ourselves, through this water. And it, it really brings a lot to the entire community. Um, and it's a real freshness having the fresh coast here. A tundra is frozen. A frozen tundra? <laughs> well, that's just redundant. But that is what Wisconsin is like for as long as winter wants to be around. We cheeseheads, however, well, we've learned to make the best of it. And with good humor, too. We have this thing in the Midwest called winter. And that's, winter is spelled with a capital W in Wisconsin, okay? Because winter is serious. There is no bad weather, John. There's only bad clothing. One thing about the Midwest, too, is your hair is screwed up pretty much from, like, September to, you got to, these are called choppers. If your choppers are not dirty, you're suspect at the bar. But it's hard to play. I can see for miles and miles. Then you know it's hard to play. During my youth, winter meant staying indoors, reading lots of books, and wondering when spring would break. And sometimes that took until summer. Wisconsin was not the water park capital of the world when I was a kid. Let me make that clear. But it is now, and as an adult, I felt obligated to check out the water parks and see what I missed out on as a kid. Tough job I got, right? Back in the early 1990s, when the first indoor water park was built in Wisconsin Dells, the whole purpose of it was really to solidify June, because Wisconsin Dells was a three month of the year vacation destination. And if it rained in June, you lost your whole summer. It's because of the seasons, and we have short summer and fall seasons, a long winter season. And then the next thing you know, people were selling out over Christmas break, they're selling out over spring break, and really a phenomenon was born, and indoor water parks took off from there. We have the largest indoor wave pool in the United States. We have duck rides that take you, you know, across land and through the river and across the lakes. We also have the Tommy Bartlett Ski Show, where, you know, it's been around for over 50 years. I mean, those family traditions that existed 50 years ago are now complemented by state-of-the-art water parks like this. They've, they've done a good job in leveraging their convention uh, business to invite the families along as well. You know, Wisconsin is a very close-knit community. We help each other out. We take care of each other. And I think that's why people come to Wisconsin and to Wisconsin Dells, because of that hospitality. Only in Wisconsin would someone come up with the idea of putting an indoor water park in a place where 200 days of the year it's 30 degrees or less. So, I mean, I think it really embodies the creative spirit of Wisconsin. As to that creative spirit in action, the cheese said, well, that's peculiar enough, but we also have a passion for art in Wisconsin. And the stranger, the better, like Concrete Park. I was able to make friends with a couple of talented Wisconsin artists on my journey. They invited me in to see their work, and yes, sometimes it did include a cheese head. But art, much like a cheese head, is hard to define. So why bother? Let's just show it to you. No, I think mostly uh, what I paint, you know, has to do with history and uh, the love for America and um, people wanting to be successful. Maybe that's part of Wisconsin too, because that's where my heritage comes from. Uh, Hardworking people that, that came to the state that uh, wanted to make a name for themselves. And a lot of these people came with nothing and started off as farmers and worked very hard to, to build up their businesses and, and their lives. Can you tell we're at the Big Guy Hat Factory? <laughs> <laughs> this is all part of it, man. You gotta love it. You're out in nature and you're carving foam. What 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 better is there, you know? 
No, this is the shop, man. This is where it all happens right here. Don't get scared. You'll only get attacked by lots of foam. Of course, what's bigger in Wisconsin than the Green Bay Packers and deer hunting? That's about the two biggest things you can get. What do we call it? The frozen tundra of Lambeau Field. If we take a look at this picture right here, that's basically what I look like when I go to these crazy games and whatever, so I'm the frozen tundra man. The cheese heads, obviously. I do things for celebrities, which is kind of something that's fun for me. I end up doing something for Harrison Ford up at EAA. I carved this in the uh, Ford uh, Motor Company. Uh, invited me into the VIP tent and they let me give this hat to Harrison Ford. Tiger Woods, another one where it was just the tiger hat. Here's one for the President of the United States right there, George W. Bush. What fits better in Wisconsin than the good old beer? The $208 million Sargento lottery winner, Mon Paz, which is famous for the Miracle Mile here in Fond du Lac. They had me make that thing up. That got worldwide attention, just that hat alone. That's what makes it happen. You don't want to get your fingers in front of that or boy, you're going to be hurting. Sketch it by hand. And this bad boy right here, it's a cut through like butter. And I can just add a little finishing angle touches on them. It's actually, believe it or not, it's a stress reliever for me because as long as I'm creating something and making someone happy, I'm happy I've done my job. This is stuff is, is wacky stuff, but it brings enjoyment. And the stuff that we've experienced, my kids have experienced through the different news teams, the interviews that they've had and all that stuff. I just hope that this is something special to them. You know, obviously we're all gonna be ashes and we're gonna hope that our stuff is remembered. That's all we can do, but it's what you leave behind for your children when you're gone is what's the most important. You're ready for game day. <laughs> huh? Is that a good look or what? Huh? I like it. It does, it brings out the color now, in your eyes too. I like that part. Beer in the other hand. Oh, well, yeah, I can make that happen, hold on. When you think of great showmen from Wisconsin, the most likely names that come to mind would be, well, Liberace for sure. And then there's Spencer Tracy and his nine Oscar nominations, the Ringling Brothers, and one of the more inventive filmmakers of all time, Orson Welles. But there was one man who grew up in Appleton, and he became the most famous man of his day. In fact, he's become so famous over time, his name is now an adjective. Ladies and gentlemen, Houdini had four brief but very fulfilling years here in Appleton, and it's easy to imagine in hindsight why he called Appleton his birthplace. He, he loved it here and he had four idyllic years, but we know now that he was born in Budapest, Hungary in 1874. But he claimed to the very end that Appleton was his birthplace. We are a pioneer in hydroelectricity, so Houdini was seeing all of these sorts of changes in the community, and I think in some ways it probably inspired him. Some of the ideas that, that got him the coverage was he was embarrassing the police chief and challenging the police chief. There's this idea that he's challenging authority and that he's pushing the boundaries of what was considered to be a fairly constrained Victorian culture. And he's appearing with no clothes, something that was, was unheard of. Here we have one of Houdini's um, original straight jackets. He often performed this suspended above a street over a crowd of thousands of people. And it was not an accident that it tended to be in the street in front of the city's most widely read newspaper. I think here's where his brilliance is. His brilliance is in self-promotion. He may not have been the best magician or the best escape artist, but he's a brilliant uh, self-promoter. It's the key to his success. It takes him from an obscure uh, vaudeville or circus performer to one of the most highly paid performers in the world. Harry Houdini, October the 29th, 1914. Taking a bridge from a famous cheesehead of the past to one in the present took me from handcuffs to a crown. And it got me to thinking, the best way over is through. When it comes to showing the world what you're made of, the best way is to be yourself. And if you can do it while being a cheesehead, well, that's even better. Of course, winning Miss America is kind of like winning the Super Bowl of pageants. And Miss America 2012, Laura Kepler, 
Oh, she's a proud cheesehead. And I got to meet her and brag about it. Miss America 2012 is Miss Wisconsin! I was crying, of course, before my name was even called, and um, just pure joy and happiness and excitement because I never dreamed this was possible for me. Your new Miss America, Miss Wisconsin. I was Miss Wisconsin many, many years ago. So our Miss Wisconsin, who of course went on to win Miss America, Laura Kepler, uh, she's kind of tough to look at. It's good to have good looking girls, you know, in such a good looking state on a map, I guess. She was one of these women who were like, Stephanie, you were Miss Wisconsin the year I was born. Thank you, Laura, thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love you, Laura. Woo! Just something more to add to all the accomplishments that the state of Wisconsin has been receiving lately. It's pretty. It's pretty cool. Should I have a cheese head made out of a crown, care? <laughs> Wonderful to see so many of your familiar faces, and this entire journey I have felt so much love and support from Kenosha. So, thank you. The local committee trying to get Aaron Rodgers, but <laughs> <laughs> one day we can only get three politicians. So, I would get asked almost in every single interview if he is called, and I would just have to say he hasn't called. The joke is on me. From the home of the reigning Super Bowl champ. If you're watching Aaron Rodgers, call me. I'm Laura Kepler, Miss Wisconsin. So I looked at his Twitter account and he said, um, you don't want to miss the girl who's singing the national anthem either. So I thought, oh my gosh, I'm going there knowing he is going to be there. Rodgers attended a Milwaukee Bucks game at which the lovely Laura Kepler was singing the national anthem. So at halftime, he made his way up there and he said hello. I said, thanks for being a good sport. He said, no problem. And that was that. Every contestant goes there and everyone takes away something from the experience because there can only be one winner. But to feel like I worked so hard for almost an entire year and then was the last one standing, can't compare. Remember, old Miss Wisconsin's never die. We just slowly gain weight. <laughs> Barron County, the county I grew up in, has what could best be described as the oddest road numbering system on the planet. Street names like 7 and a Half Avenue, 21st and a Quarter Street, and the most wonderful of them all, 13 and 5 eighths. As to the rest of the state... Well, basically, Wisconsin was the very first governmental unit in the world to ever use numbers, a system of numbers to identify roads. So that's a very unique thing, because everybody all over the world does that now. Wisconsin did it first in 1917, Michigan, being the copycats they are, followed in 1918, and then of course it spread from there. The U.S. highway system came along in 1926, and then the interstates came along about three decades later. So to celebrate Wisconsin's highways, that's why I started my statetrunktour.com. Basically, it's taking every Wisconsin state highway and making it like it's its own Route 66. And of course, the best way to travel all of those freeways, highways, and back roads is on a Harley Davidson. People like to ride them because it gives them a feeling of freedom and enjoyment of the open road. We'll go on a bike run with 20 guys. By the end of the day, we got 40 with us. <laughs> you know, so it's I've it's, seen those trails. It, it's yeah. pretty neat. It's pretty neat. You know, you and a chain uh, of them coming past me on the car. Absolutely. And you know, everyone's in it for the same thing. They love the ride. They they love meeting new people. They love the open road. They love the freedom. And you're around people that have the same interests and likes that you do. It's pretty much Wisconsin Harley are together in one. It's just the best, of the best. You can go anywhere in the country, anywhere in the world, and there's Harleys. Harley's been around since 1903. There's a lot of history here. These Harleys came from Wisconsin. I bought my husband a Harley shortly after we got married. Yeah, there's a lot of people that uh, buy a new Harley, ride it, and they're basically Harley riders. Of course, we own an old shovel head. The cool thing about those things is that you get to fix them up. I enjoy building things and creating things, so that's why it's in the house. Harley does basically have a patent on the sound. And the muffler system is made to sound unique, and it does sound the best. 
It is unique. There's nothing else like it. A Yamaha doesn't sound like that. A Suzuki doesn't sound like that. No other bike sounds like that but a Harley. The guys who own Harleys, and especially the old ones, they are so proud of those bikes. So do you have an intimate relationship with your Harley? I rebuilt this Harley. It's custom made for my body. You love this thing, don't you? I love it. This is my baby. Harley's basically the worldwide symbol of somewhat of the badass guys. They're just badass. You look at them, you, you talk to people that own them, everybody knows it. You know, there's got a lot of cheese heads out here, but uh, Harley guys, we're badass. And that's all there is to it. It's easy to be a part of nature when you're driving around the great north woods of Wisconsin. Time moves slower there. You're no longer stressed, you can think clearly, you can breathe the air. And best of all, you'll be lucky if your smartphone can even get a signal. But there's still a lot going on north of the tension line. Just make sure you watch out for deer when driving. And maybe a hot egg too. Some say it's a mythical creature. I do believe I've had a couple cocktails and I've seen the hodag and actually had to fend for my life. The settlers in northern Wisconsin and Rhinelander were looking for a drawing card for people to come to the area. And they ultimately came to this local timber cruiser and humorist and very well-known uh, person named Eugene Shepard. What he came up with was to capture this hodag. And he theoretically captured it, brought it to the fairgrounds, and charged people a nickel to see it in his tent. Take a look at that whole egg up on top. That's taking care of the city of Rhinelander in its own fashion. And Paul Bunyan, you'll see him all over the Northwoods. Well, I spent about a year and a half going into the archives of collectors who had edited the tales for publication in the 19-teens and 20s and was able to trace the very first Paul Bunyan story to Wisconsin. Today, all over the country, people know the name Paul Bunyan, but it all started right here in Wisconsin in the 1880s. Every summer, lumberjacks and lumberjills from around the world come to Hayward, Wisconsin for the World Lumberjack Championships. And that, oh, that's Lumberjack Nirvana. And now we're here into the finals. Well, we just finished the uh, the Lumberjack uh, World Championships. It started in 1960. Holy smokes, it's gotta be hot in there. You know, there's no other place in the world that has uh, this kind of attention. This is the best show in North America. Okay, the 20-inch white pine logs. This wood is fantastic. These guys are going for it. Who's it going to be? One, two, three, or four? You asked the Lumberjacks that, and, and they love the Wisconsin hospitality and the fact that we're cheeseheads and that, that we're going to bend over backwards. And, and when they come here, they're going to have fun, they're going to party, and they're going to compete hard, and they're going to give us everything we've got, just like anything else we do here in Wisconsin. Hayward community has spawned many uh, world champions. So we've got uh, uh, tree climbers, we've got log rollers and the boom runners. Cassidy's got about a throw lead here going at the 45. It's going to be close. Cassidy hits the line. Sterling hits the line. It is going to go. The beautiful musky queen to present the trophy to Cassidy Share, our 60 foot traditional climb world champion. I mean, it's just like loggers and, and lumberjacks go right back to like packers. I mean, we're 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 ancient uh, symbols, and I mean that's just that's just who we are. This is the state of Wisconsin, and and cheeseheads and loggers and, and uh, lumberjacks they all go together. As to the aforementioned deer, well, there's plenty of hunting and fishing to be had in the great North Woods of Wisconsin. A few years ago, we harvested 600,000 deer, and that was a record for all states in all years as far as recorded history is concerned. When I say harvest, I, I think of it in the term just like a farmer would harvest his crops. And it's good conservationists. We want to take care of the land. We want to be respectful. We want to make sure animals aren't maimed or harmed. But yes, we do shoot them to be able to eat them and harvest them and uh, control the populations. The downside of so many deer is that occasionally you hit them with your vehicles. When they have their mind made up that they're going to cross the road, they're going to cross the road whether you blow the horn or whether you're there or not. Because the signs are a promise. They're not a warning, they're a promise. There will be deer there. Um, and you'll see deer everywhere. I've seen deer in town here so many places. But if it's me taking the ditch or taking the deer, I'm going to take the deer, unfortunately, because if I take the ditch, I may uh, run into a tree and might not live to tell about it. They're a strange set of animals. 
that's a turdy pointer. Did you see the turdy pointer? That is the exact look that the deer gets just before you throw a slug into them. You know what's the old axiom? When's the best time to fish? Whenever you get the opportunity. Wisconsin is a fabulous state for fishing. The musky capital of the world, as we're often touted. Obviously, directly behind me is the largest musky on display in the world. We have 15,000 lakes, maybe 30,000 miles of stream for fishing. When the snow recedes, when, when the ice goes away, uh, everyone's ready to go out and have a good time. Because the one thing we know that's coming is winter again. Indian tribes are a part of the Wisconsin landscape. They give us a deep connection to Mother Earth through honoring nature. You come from the land, and so you return to it. And there's no better source than the source, those who were there before anyone else, to give you an intimate understanding of the land we call Wisconsin. So I went to my tribal chairman at the Lakota Ray Reservation near Hayward to do just that. Were we really cheeseheads before we were cheeseheads? I would say that we are a proud part of what is now known as Wisconsin. Stephanie Klatt is the right now the Secretary of Tourism, and we have a partnership, and she's out there selling the state to people to come here and take a vacation, fishing, hunting, the natural resources, and cultural tourism. Come and see the tribes. Well, what's really important is family, and that's what we're here today for, homecoming celebration. A lot of the towns are named with tribal names, uh, the rivers, the creeks, the streams. You wouldn't have a state of Wisconsin if it wasn't for the tribes. We are a proud part of the landscape here. Whether they're a Packer fan or not a Packer fan, whether they're a hunter or a non-hunter, whether a businessman or an environmentalist or both, the term cheesehead, I think of someone from Wisconsin and affectionately. Even in the romantic picture of America that you see in books, that's where we live. It's the greatest place to be on earth. And that's why I say I would not want to live any place else. Just off the shores of Bayfield, out on Lake Superior, are the Apostle Islands National Lakeshore. Amongst them is Madeline Island, one of the oldest contiguous settlements in the United States, sacred ground for the Ojibwa tribes, and about as peaceful a place as one could imagine. If you like that sort of thing. After all this running around, I was in need of a few moments of tranquility, and this was the perfect place for it. But even here, in the middle of the greatest lake in the world, the cheesehead's sense of humor thrives, be it a bit more subtle than the rest of Wisconsin. Tom's Burned Down Cafe. Yeah, it burned down, but they never got around to rebuilding it in the usual fashion. It's all outdoors, with quotes nailed to the walls and the floors and everywhere else you can think of, except the ceiling, of course. Before leaving, I visited the LaPointe Indian Cemetery and it sent me pondering even more than usual. These were the original cheeseheads before the idea ever existed. They got along with the settlers, not just because they had to, but because they wanted to. I had set out to discover what it meant to be a cheesehead. But more and more, I was discovering who I was in ways I had never seen myself before. As I watched the sun go down over Lake Superior that night, I realized that the true value of an experience like this was about the desire to share those experiences with others in order to be a part of something bigger, better, and more worthy than oneself. And who in the right mind wouldn't want that? Speaking of another tribe, the one you likely expected from the start, of course. Well, for that I had to go to the city at the end of the bay. And while it is the home of the Packers, it's also a town with a quite unique personality. If you've never been there, you might wonder how such a small town can have such a massively successful NFL franchise. If you have been to Green Bay, well, you know exactly why. Steeped in tradition, the world's best tailgating, and 13 NFL World Championships. It's the mecca of football, and the Packers are the religion. And right across the street from the NFL's Vatican, Lambeau Field, 
is the Green Bay Blizzard, an Arena League football team that is more than proud to play in the shadow of the Almighty. It's a football town, but we, we still have the, the Blizzard. We are relatively new, and uh, every day we got to prove ourselves. Yeah. We try to keep the energy level as high as we can. This is the only city in the NFL, or any sports city, whereby the whole city revolves around the number one sports team in the city. This is the most amazing town to be in. I tell you, it's fun. We are the number one professional team in the city of Green Bay. The Green Bay Packers, that's a religion, and we don't count that. <laughs> God, you know, around here it really is a religion. Now, having been a lifelong Packer fan, it wasn't until I re moved to Wisconsin that um, I realized just how ingrained the love for the Packers are and how deep that goes. And so I have Vince is saying, God, family, Packers. Right order, kind of burns out the hair though. I'm sorry I'm not wearing my cheese head cap. No, I have one at home. One I wear for church on Sundays. I'd be willing to bet that we're the only place where you can go to church on Sunday and a majority of the congregation is wearing Packer jerseys and Brett Favre jerseys instead of you know, your normal church clothes. The, one of the first things I was told is on the game days when uh, kickoff is at noon, you've got to keep your sermon short. <laughs> well, it got to a certain point when I got old enough that it was Sundays was let's get through church as fast as we can and get home because the game is on. A great friend of mine took me to a, a Packer game and I'm telling you it was almost like going to a cathedral. It was just an amazing experience. So uh, I got converted, I took the pledge and I'm a born again Packer fan. And, and you know we talk about cheese heads and we talk about being Packer fans and being fans of the Packer is one of those things that forms community. And I think it's important, you know, because it's a part of forming identity. We eat cheese curds together. We eat, we drink great beer together. We have the best bratwurst in the world. Sunday is the holy day, but it's a holy day for football. Amen. What that has helped me do is to find just how much I'm a part of something much bigger than myself. That sums it up. <laughs> Religion and passion. You've been to tailgates, you've been, which to me stands out. I mean, nobody else can, nobody else in the world tailgates the way Wisconsin slash Packer fans do it. I don't know too many casual Packer fans. I know a lot of super Packer fans. They remind me of people that were in line during the, uh, when the Star Wars movies came out again after 20 years and they were lined up in sleeping bags in the parking lot. You know, anytime that you can show your love for something and just have fun. I mean, anytime I see St. Vince or the uh, fence painter, or something like that, you just feel good inside. You want to talk about what it's like to be a cheese head? Right here. <laughs> People that put themselves on the line and take risks in life, like the crazy Packer fans, I admire them. They don't care what other people think. You see cars uh, painted a certain style, vans painted a certain style that are in that parking lot year after year after year. The tailgate parties are getting more elaborate, more elaborate. The menus are better. Uh, you know, really kind of just brings home the atmosphere and the, and the fun that the Packer fans have. Happy game day, everybody! I ask, you know, how often do you have a photograph taken of you in the course of a day? St. Vince has told me upwards of 500 photographs when you have people standing in line, smiling, waiting to have a photo taken with you. That's almost a drug. It's not just a game. This is a lifestyle. This is a tradition. This is my trip to Mecca. Oh, no, not at all. No, money is no object when you come to tailgating. And uh... the fun thing for me is just the interaction with the, with the fans and with the kids. And I love the fans I've met. I consider these people family. It's kind of like church or it's kind of like the dog park where people are all kind of coming together for a common purpose. This purpose just happens to be stuffing the face, you know, because there's beer, there's brats, there's burgers, there's steaks, there's pork chops. Wild game will be uh, cooked on the grill and things like that. And the amount of seasonings and everything that you smell, it's unbelievable. It's not just about eating, but it's about what's going on in their lives. And again, like I say, the camaraderie, friendship, and fellowship. May the force be with you. G
Once I finished tailgating Lambeau Field for the umpteenth time, it gave me an even greater appreciation for where all that great food comes from. And the people we have to thank for all of that are the hardworking, no-nonsense, dawn-to-dusk farmers who make Wisconsin food some of the best in the world, especially when it comes to cheese. And no matter where you go, it's pretty safe to say that no one does cheese better than the dairy state. There's probably not another state that is as closely identified with a product as Wisconsin is with cheese. We are kind of the shining star right now in the cheese world. We are the number one producer of cheese in the United States. Cheese is good. If we just counted the cheese that we produce in Wisconsin by itself, we would be the fourth largest cheese producer in the world. It's a $43.4 billion industry. It's a $43 billion industry? 43.4. <laughs> that point four is a lot. That's a lot of cheese. Yeah, we make a lot of cheese, but we also win more awards for our cheese than any other state and uh, most other countries out there. We've won a, a large percentage of contests, whether it's American Cheese Society, whether it's the World Contest. You know, the Sid Cooks and the Car from Car Valley and the Satori's and the Windmere's, I mean, they just rack up the ribbons. We're truly a, a player in the cheese industry worldwide. We make about 80 different varieties. Many of the cheeses that we do are uh, American originals, um, meaning that we just made them up. Over the last uh, 11 or 12 years, we're up to 538 national and international awards. One of the things right now Wisconsin offers that no other state does is a Wisconsin's master cheesemaker program. They take great pride in it and, and the discussions that we have and the passion that, that comes out during those discussions, it's really different and I think it really sets us apart. As I've had the opportunity to develop New cheeses, I almost feel like they're my children. Um, so oh, yeah. cradle to grave, uh, developing something new. If a person wants to become a cheesemaker, if that's their aspiration, there is no finer place than Wisconsin. We've got a great infrastructure here. There's a, the support network needed uh, for cheesemaking to uh, be successful. It's such a part of who we are in Wisconsin. I mean, we truly are America's Dairyland and have been for a well over a century now. And the thing that's very unique about our cheese manufacturers are they're innovative. We were the first to have a shredded cheese. We also introduced the concept of peg bar merchandising to the dairy section. We were the first to have a resealable package of cheese. And in fact, we were the first to have a resealable package of any perishable food product. Wisconsin's known for, for Brick and Colby uh, and Limburger, the stinky cheese. <laughs> but we also have uh, an array of what we call European and style cheeses that our cheesemakers have made their own. And our artisan cheesemakers uh, are, are playing a very, very important uh, role in the success of our industry. It makes people understand how thoughtful our people are because these are very thoughtful cheeses. Oh, they're becoming a much larger portion of the overall state dairy um, business, yeah. the specialty cheese. And from the early 90s up to the present day, from I think it was 4 to 5 percent as far as specialty cheese production to now where it's cl it's close to 20 percent. This is our wonderful pack room. It's a temperature control room that we process the cheese and we cut it into a bunch of different variety of sizes. So as you can see, we put it in the package after it cuts, goes into the machine, weighed, scaled, and label. You probably see this product all over the place too as well. It's called waxing. Then we'll let it dry for a little while and then we'll do it again. And that seals it real solid so it can age really well. Uh, this specialty packaging is uh, its very labor intensive operation, but at the same time it's a necessity because without it, you're not going to get it into the individual's hands. They're probably not going to want to buy 40 pound blocks and take it home. It might take them a couple years to eat that much. Unless you're from Wisconsin, because us cheeseheads probably go through that in about a month. It appears often that we don't take ourselves all that seriously. And of course, the question of why we don't take ourselves seriously is an important question, but we don't. You know, it's a place where there's probably more cows than there are people. The people at Packer games and Brewer games and Badger games and all kinds of other games who wear those cheeseheads and all the other garments that are now available have done our state, I think, a great service. That's the aspect I really like, putting on these stupid foam heads and pretending I don't know what. I think that's wonderful. You know, people maybe kind of poke fun. I think they're poking fun because they're jealous that they're not a cheesehead. So a cheesehead may come across as, as, a, as a joke, 
but it does have a rich tradition with it that really shows our, our pride for, for what we are all about in our state. If we were starting from scratch to build a brand like we have in Wisconsin with our dairy industry and our cheese recognition, there isn't enough money in the world to build from scratch what we have today. And as if that food porn wasn't enough, like couldn't leave out the brats, bacon, and beef, we may not make the most, but we do make the best. Besides, we cheeseheads even invented the hamburger, according to this historian. In 1885, hamburger Charlie Negreen made the first hamburger. Charlie was an enterprising young man, and he came to the fair to make some money. He was gonna sell these meatballs to people, but, well, they couldn't eat their meatballs walking. So Charlie had an idea, and he flattened that meatball down in a patty, put it in between two pieces of bread, and sure enough, the burger was born. Wisconsin, birthplace of the hamburger, frozen custard capital of the world, and home to Culver's. Of course, we started with one restaurant here in Sauk City, Wisconsin, and today uh, we are spread uh, across 19 states, uh, primarily the Midwest. And Jacqueline, nobody believes me when I say that's from Wisconsin. <laughs> yeah, it's American Dream Company. We started out with six people, and we built it into an international company. It's a proof that you can do it here in America, and uh, we're real proud of where we came from. R.C. Newski actually filled up the back of his automobile with hams and bacon and, and things from his family's farm, and he drove around northern Wisconsin. So, you know, in the last 20 or 30 years, you can find us in almost any state in the Union. We're talking about Wisconsin and how proud we are of it, but we're also talking about small-town America. When I think of small town America, I think of hardworking people, I think of honest people, I think of loyal people. Uh, we know what we do and we do it really well. We applewood smoke things. We don't deviate from, from our original recipe. We don't jump on a lot of trends. You know, we're about sausages here in Wisconsin as well. The bratwurst. I mean, what better tailgating food than the bratwurst. Uh, now we have, I, I believe, over 100 different types of brats, but the most popular ones seem to be the ones that are the sports ones. So we have a badger brat and a packer brat. You know, it is kind of appropriate, too, that it's the packers, and they were named after a meat packing company. And of course, here in Seymour, we have a Hamburger Charlie, and the whole burger festival is uh, supported by American food groups. And whenever the Packers are in the Super Bowl, our business increased quite a bit. We developed this Sasquatch character. It's been quite successful. We tuned him into Feed Your Wild Side, which we think is what people do when they buy beef jerky, is there's something in you that feels that you want to feed your wild side. And our company is about fun, and, and he certainly has added to it. Well, yeah, we did get to be the number one producer of beef jerky coming out of this little town of 500 people. As far as I'm concerned, Wisconsin is second to to none. I, we, we have great food here in Wisconsin, whether it's some gourmet type of food or, you know, burgers. At that first burger fest, we wanted to do something special, so we made the world's largest hamburger, 5,462 pounds. Then in 2001, we decided to do an 8,266 pound burger. Our business isn't necessarily about the butter burger or frozen custard. It's about the people and the experience they create with each other and with the guests in our restaurants. That's what makes a butter burger taste better. That's what makes frozen custard taste better. That's what makes living in Wisconsin better as well. My impressions are that um, the beer is phenomenal. On most of my previous visits to the US, I have been left with a very negative impression of, of beer. On this trip, I'm delighted to say my opinions have been reversed. We, we are proud of that beer. Despite our reputation as being just beer and cheese, we actually do have taste. It's all about cheese up here, and beer, and cheese, and beer, and beer. Yeah, I think more people eat cheese than drink beer. Ooh, that's a toss-up. Beer and In cheese. this state? <laughs> Are you sure about that? No. Brats and cheese, yeah, I mean, you see that at the tailgate, and that's just part of the food that goes with the beer. Beer and cheese isn't too bad a thing to be noted for. <laughs> In many ways, people don't realize when both beer and cheese that good dates all the way back 150 years ago. Back in 1861, started the Civil War. A lot of those soldiers didn't like to drink creek water, 
And so many of them being German immigrants, their families sent them beer, and the number of breweries blossomed, particularly in Milwaukee. Well, Milwaukee has a long history of brewing, and a lot of it ties into the German heritage that we have here. The fact that as soon as you hit Milwaukee city limits, it smells like beer makes me laugh every time. You can be like sleep and wake up and be like, oh, we're in Milwaukee. The fact that our baseball team is named the Milwaukee Brewers and they play in Miller Park shows you just how strong the, the beer heritage is here. Yeah, I happen to be a Miller adherent. Wisconsin's had that tradition forever, and a while back, some local smaller breweries decided, hey, let's start it back up, and, and it's really taken off. The, the resurgence of the microbreweries is one of the best things that's happened to the state. People like, when they come to Wisconsin, they want to try the local, the local beers. It's not only produce great beer, which in itself creates a, a good economy, but it also gives the major international stale breweries a run for their money. It's quality, it's uh, people trading up. We put a lot of smiles on people's faces, though, don't we? Beer is proof God loves us, right? <laughs> all, all beer. <laughs> That's what you get if you go to the tavern a lot. What's the difference between saying tavern belly and beer yet? Nothing. You got a hand to Wisconsin for beer, no question. We like good beer. I mean, usually in these little towns, there's more taverns than there are churches, or they're, they're about equal in number, you know? You get into a beer drinking contest with somebody from down south, and you, they find out you're from Wisconsin. They don't want to play anymore. Uh, Napa's the wine country. We're the beer country. If you're a beer connoisseur, this is Mecca. <laughs> <laughs> if you haven't been to Wisconsin, and you haven't seen a Packer game, and you haven't drank beer, then you haven't lived. In fact, I think we should just stop shooting and go to a bar right now. What do you think? <laughs> But instead of a bar, I decided to one-up that and go straight to the breweries and talk to the brewmasters themselves. <laughs> oh man, was that fun. Well, we're probably surrounded by about 10 million cans of beer, filled beer. No man could finish that in his life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, now it's Minhas Brewery. Second oldest brewery in the United States, uh, 1845 grown quite a bit since then, from probably less than a thousand barrels a year to well over 300,000 barrels of beer. Every conceivable beer style in the world is made in Wisconsin. The economic impact is uh, over three and a half billion dollars, direct impact. Indirect, it's almost, it's more than twice that, it's over eight billion dollars. Wisconsin's unique in the amount of liquor licenses. We have more licenses per capita than any state in the country. That's why so often you come to a town like uh, Chatech here, 2,000 people, you'll see eight, 10 bars. It's very, very typical in Wisconsin. Because that's where people get their dinner, too. Mm -hmm. That's true, yes. We have quite a few of them that serve food and beer. The quality of good brew in the state, that we may not make the most, but we make some of the best. Would that be a fair statement about beer That here? is a very fair statement, yeah. It's trying to get something out of you. It's trying to get something off your chest and out of yourself to somewhere else. That's the great thing about craft breweries. A personality shows back on their beer. We don't have a taste panel saying that let's make it this way or that way to make it palatable for more people. We kind of do what we want. But we feel our mission is we make beer, that beer is an adjunct to the enjoyment of life. Wisconsin brewers are very creative and not afraid to push the envelope. And like you said, if we're, we're not offending somebody, we're not, not doing our job. You know, it's not a two-dimensional um, freak show or show off. Um, that, oh, oh, sorry, I can't talk to you. This beer needs me to pay attention. <laughs> no, it's just part of the process. And you're enjoying life, and this is just part of it. This was actually uh, an alleyway at one point. We have five lagering tanks, and it's got to settle in here uh, a couple weeks, um, depending on the beer. About 100 years ago, the hops were grown in Wisconsin and New York, and uh, what happened was they had a blight. What happens is you're gonna get a fungus that's gonna crawl up the vine, and it's gonna destroy the crop. I've got one little piece of good dirt in the corner with some wood chips around it and some peat moss. This is a gravel parking lot, and I'm growing hops. Just about everybody somewhere is growing some hops. Born and raised here in Wisconsin. Regardless of how much we branched out with our beers, it's attractive to those people that grew up here. Once they start calling it Lineys, you know that you've got something going because it's personal to them. And when you work next to others, you have an appreciation for what they contribute. You know, the beer does not make itself. You know, we value the people who work here because, you know, without them, there is no beer, there's no brewery. There's the uh, Native American aspect. I think. I'm assuming that's a tribute to. Yeah, it very much is. Uh, there's really two placeholders for having the Indian maiden 
uh, in our labeling. And the early one certainly is a tribute to the Ojibwe Chippewa Indians, which inhabited this area first before any of us did, and secondly to the area for tourism and vacation in the Indian Head country. I have always felt like I really wanted our brewery to be part of the fabric of Wisconsin. I want to be something that at the end of the day, you know, we add to our community. I have a passion for this part of the world. I just think it's the best place on the planet. And I've traveled all over, I've lived in different states, and, and they're all interesting and nice, but there's nothing that can touch Wisconsin. Everybody wants to go to Lambeau at some point, whether they're from LA or New York, it doesn't matter. Every one of our liney distributors saying, hey, can I get tickets to a Packer game when the Giants are playing or when Oakland's playing? And I'm saying, that's eh, gonna be a tough ticket. Yeah, we got one uh, Johnny Blood Irish Red and uh, Johnny Blood was, um, they called him the Vagabond Halfback. We hope he'd be proud of our, um, uh, our beer because a lot of his cool stories of Johnny Blood kind of happen at this depot because he was known for his partying ways and a few times he missed the train to go play a game and he would miss it from here and have to uh, drive a car and, and block a train track farther down the, the, the line to stop the Packer train from going out. The stories of him leaping across uh, courtyards at hotels so he could get a bottle of whiskey out of Curly Lambeau's uh, room, etc. I mean, they're just amazing. They got a wall where you guys are painted in it. Bob Gartner's yeah, a little bit. Brewery on the Hill, it's the famous war of beer versus wine. Our brewery's up on the hill and Steins of beer are having their way with the uh, wine bottles. The wine industry has exploded in Wisconsin. We all know beer has been really big in the past. But recently, wine has really started to take off, especially our Cheesehead White. And every bottle of Cheesehead White comes with its own cheese wedge. I am a Cheesehead and damn proud of it. And I will wear the crazy cheese block on my head. My wife has the cheese block for the behind, okay? And you've seen a lot of other accessories out of cheese. So it's it's gone beyond cheese head now to the rest of the cheese body. As good fortune would have it, I met NFL Hall of Famer Dave Robinson and his writing partner, Rice Boyles, at a book signing at Festival Foods in Eau Claire. Dave's a Packers legend and a real lovable guy. He even let my brother and I try on his Super Bowl one ring. So I had to ask, what did they think of Cheesehead Nation? You can't appreciate how great the fans are in Green Bay as a player until you leave and go somewhere else. And, you, and then you long for those fans in Green Bay, Wisconsin. There are so few things that families do together, but part of it is to follow a team. There's a love affair between the team and the fans. We give to each other. We both grow on each other. We both nourished by the, the love and respect from each other. And that was the difference in Green Bay and other places I've been. It's part of the fabric of a lot of people in Wisconsin. These new things with the hats, the cheese heads and everything else, they're taking it to a, to a higher level. The whole cheese head concept, I think, is it's a badge of honor. I do not wear a cheese head. I'm old school, but I respect the people that do, and I understand what they're doing. They're making a statement. You can not saw Green Bay Packer fans. They went and made the cheese heads. Yeah, we're cheese heads. They brought that in. And we cheese heads are going to kick your butt. And that's it. And that's it. They're just, they're just great people. And I love the fans of Green Bay. I tell you, they're, they're, I tell you they're the greatest fans ever. Well, I, I'm working real hard to try to make something out of Dave Robinson. You know, I, I wish we could I wish bring him out of his shell and let him talk or something like that. I did play in the first two Super Bowls, and I am not a lifelong Packer fan. I am a lifelong Packer. So there I was, tailgating at Lambeau Field yet again. And who did I happen to meet this time? The kicker responsible for one of my childhood's most lasting memories. The Polish Prince, Chester Markle. How big was Chester Markle back in the day, our day, like in high school now? Oh, he was Wasn't he, was he the, amazing. he was, he might have been the biggest celebrity kicker in the history of the NFL, at least in one city. 1980s opening day game with the Packers and the Bears. Chester Markle kicking that field goal. Now this picture behind you, Classic shot. Pretty awesome. <laughs> Pretty awesome. And now you, I, I want to ask about that, but first I want to say that's kind of what you really got that, that sort of fame for with the Packer fans. But yeah, you had a big, big career prior to that. I had a big career, but uh, Larry McCarron and I were doing something Thursday night, and he says, you know, that was my fault that that field goal was blocked. Uh, I said, well, thanks for making me famous. <laughs> you know, we could try to recapture this situation thousands of times and it would not work out this way. You know, it's one of those things that just happens. A little boy's dream coming full circle. It doesn't get much better than that. Or maybe it does. 
After all, I did get to meet Bart Starr again more than three decades after that first inspired encounter. Still a gentleman, still very inspiring, still the greatest Green Bay Packer to ever play. After all of these amazing experiences, I felt as though my deeper understanding of the meaning of being a cheesehead was becoming even clearer. But I still had to look into whether cheeseheads could survive in the wild, or at least on an island in the middle of Lake Michigan. After all, you can't say you've covered all of Wisconsin if you haven't been to Washington Island. Washington Island is a really, really cool part of Door County uh, for the simple fact that you've got to cross Death's Door to get there. Years ago, a number of Indians riding in canoes uh, drowned because of a storm that came up really quick, and then it, it was named Death's Door. Washington Island is an opportunity to live life as life is meant to be lived. I mean, people talk about being on island time. We're 15 miles from Sister Bay and, and 15 years behind them, and we like it that way. I love the history of the area, the natural history as well as the human history. I think we represent what Wisconsin was fundamentally all about. Pioneers with a little pirate spirit. I love that. Walter Cronkite loves that. <laughs> we offer them a great opportunity to add a little pirate to that cheesehead designation. <laughs> Washington Island is a very wonderful part of Wisconsin and a special part of Wisconsin, but definitely cheesehead country. But people are fanatics here about the Packers, I would say. Bart Starr was the speaker, and uh, at the end of his speech, uh, he threw the football across the table. So he caught from Bart Starr, is what yeah. you're saying. There's some amazing yeah. signatures on there. Here's Bart Starr's right here. Nelson's Hall never closed during Prohibition. When Prohibition started, Tom Nelson went and got a pharmaceutical license to dispense bitters. Bitters back in the day was known as a stomach tonic. So he went to court and got permission to leave his establishment open by selling Angostura bitters. We're the longest legally continuous tavern in the state of Wisconsin, possibly the whole United States. Got the town wave thing going on? Yeah. If you're on Washington Island, it is not okay if you don't wave at absolutely everyone. People were waving all the time to me, and I thought it was really cool because I'd heard about it before. And you're sure you didn't owe money? And that's a, a way to, uh, uh, to recognize people and to let them know that uh, we love each other. It's a uniqueness. They're not used to having somebody wave to them that they probably never have met or they could end up meeting them by the end of the day. It's really important when you're a community that's isolated, particularly in winter, that you get along with each other, that you find common ground because you're going to need one another someday, somehow. If you don't wave, you're, you're kind of a stiff, so <laughs> join the club and wave, be friendly. Words do evolve, meanings do change. They oftentimes take on a life all their own. Yet in the end, it's the culture itself that chooses to accept or reject the label placed upon it by others. Having interviewed 200 plus people by this point, I had to know what they thought the deeper meaning of being a cheesehead was. Is there a deep meaning? That is a big question. I don't have the words to explain a true cheesehead. Wisconsin's population is many things. It's got the word cheese, so it's got to be a good thing. It's a love of cheese. Good attitude, drink the beer, eat the sausage. Blue collar type stuff. Kind of means family to me. Go home to the family after a hard day and sit around the table and have supper and uh, get up and do it again the next day. Absolutely, I'm a cheesehead. I chose to live in Wisconsin. An interesting term for, for Wisconsinite, but Wisconsinites wear pretty much any hat. You wear a cheesehead, you're belonging to a, to a culture. If there's one word I could use to describe a cheesehead, is loyalty. Loyalty runs pretty deep, generational deep, and people take a lot of pride in, in, in their community. There's a lot of pride in being a cheesehead and being from Wisconsin. Someone who represents Wisconsin, and I feel like if you're a cheesehead, you gotta represent it well. We have a dog named Lambo. Cheesehead, you think it is. You need to make it so fluid. <laughs> oh, the dance. Wisconsin people are very intrepid and industrious, and that embodies a cheesehead. Just never give up, you're always there. Always in it. So you don't consider yourself a cheesehead? Sure. I'm stubborn. <laughs> and dense. Dense at times. I've worn this for other things, and people always say Packers and stuff like that, but it's, it's more about just the spirit of, of, of the state of Wisconsin. It represents that we are from Wisconsin. It's a birthright. Being home, 
this is home and you want to make your home the best place to be. You know, we're proud of the things it produces, you know, all the wonderful dairy, the cheese, you know, the chocolate, the beer. It's about where home is, you know, where you put your feet on the ground and you feel comfortable there. And the cheese head, you know, is pretty much fun, okay? That's a cheese head. He died a cheese head for sure. <laughs> I'm just cloning around. <laughs> Not that big of a deal. There are some really good qualities about our state. What's so great about Wisconsin is the people. I love the people. I mean, they're just good, solid folks. And they generally come bearing cheese. I've heard that we have cold weather but warm people. The winters can be long, they can be unbearable. It sure makes the summer sweet. That spirit of independence, that spirit of being tough, those guys that will actually cut a hole in ice so they can fish. I think the people of Wisconsin are as genuine as anywhere in the world, and they're as welcoming as anybody in the world. If you're a cheesehead from Wisconsin, everybody recognizes that. It's a great place to learn to be a human being. Group cheesehead. Group cheesehead. Yeah. We're all cheeseheads. Yes. If you give 100% effort, those people will support you. What they don't have a tolerance for, though, is when you don't give 100% effort. Generally, uh, a great place to exist. And this is where your heart will always be because this is where you're from. We are drunk naked people in the winter. I mean, it's one thing to be drunk and naked in Texas or, or even Cincinnati, but to be drunk and naked in, in Wisconsin, that's a statement. We do it very easily. There were many things I wasn't able to include for my journeys. That beloved G, for example. After all, even an average-sized state is quite large. Especially one that extends to the entirety of Cheesehead Nation. But sometimes, that's just the way things go. And let's face it, we Cheeseheads have proven ourselves quite good at not taking things all too seriously. As to that deeper meaning of being a Cheesehead, being a Cheesehead isn't just about Wisconsin a sports team, or a silly hat. It's about being proud of where you're from, about community and acceptance. A cheesehead is the family that loves you no matter what, the friends you carry with you on life's journey, and the new friends you make along the way, about striving to become the best person you can possibly be, and about knowing every person matters. It's a state of mind and a way of life that started in one place but has now traveled around the world to become its own glorious nation. I returned to the place of my youth to see if it could possibly be as amazing as I had remembered. <laughs> Turns out it was even better. No matter where I go, Wisconsin will always be my home because that will forever be where my heart is. Time is not a lie, I feel it flying by. You know, and you take a little town like Green Bay, and they are the only team owned by the fans. Uh, that says a lot. Yes, my boss up to the top, one of our NFL owners. I'm Sherry Virgin, as you can see, and I own the Green Bay Packers. I am not an owner. My brother-in-law is an owner. Well, I do have one share. I own a piece of the Green Bay Packers. <laughs>
And I'm an equally minor shareholder as well. <laughs> TJ, I cheese it, and I own the Green Bay Packers. My name is Mark, and I own the Green Bay Packers. Yeah, I'm a proud owner of the Green Bay Packers. I own the Green Bay Packers twice! 97 and 2011. I own 200 shares of Packers stock, which I'm very proud of. I own the Green Bay Packers just once. It doesn't give me any voting rights, but it gives me a bit more bragging rights. I'm Greg Heaving from Appleton, and I'm an owner of the Green Bay Packers. Proud to be an owner of the Green Bay Packers as a stockholder. Bruce Reisler, and I am a friend of the owner of the Green Bay Packers. Packer fan. Uh, strike that Packer owner. Having my ownership of uh, the Green Bay Packers stock is is something that I'll hand down to my kids, so. I'm an owner, I that's my team. I'm a proud owner of the Green Bay Packers. I feel like I'm an owner even if I don't have a piece of paper. Of course, my required uh, stock in the Green Bay Packers. Rick Nelson, Canton, Ohio, and an owner since 1997. Me and my wife own uh, a share, yes. <laughs> You're the president, each have one. <laughs> they all feel they own that franchise whether they do or not. I'm Tom Favitz of Key Wascom, and I would really love to own the Green Bay Packers. <laughs> I'd love to have one. <laughs> I know you got one. Yeah. And I, too, own Green Bay Packers. Here's my proof. I'm definitely a cheese. It, me it means I really like cheese. <laughs> oh, this hurts. Go back, go! What do you think of being called a cheesehead? <laughs> <laughs> if I could be a cheese, what would I be? Rustalipa, specially aged cheddars, beer cheese, espresso rub, parmesan, jalapeno, Monterey Jack, feta cheese, cheese curds. Swiss cheese, panello, queso blanco, Eastern Mediterranean cheeses, bandage wrap cheddars, French cheeses, blue type cheeses, cheddars with different flavor profiles, surface ripened cheeses. Yeah, those would be the ones. Okay, there's a bunch of guys outside with guns in their backs. We shoot the deer. We shoot them. And then we eat them. It's hunting season. It is time to combine two great Wisconsin traditions. The Miller End Zone and the Roll Out the Barrel Polka. We've got director Mike Matzdorf and the star of the movie, among many other things, Green Bay native Tony Shalhoub. I want you all to come out and see our movie shot right here in Wisconsin called Feed the Fish. Morning, Sheriff. <laughs> Duck soup all around. No, wait. It's deer season, isn't it? You're not right in the head. And all of us who have met you, John, know that you're not quite right in the head. There's quirkiness in Wisconsin, so we will now be the Wisconsin earthquake capital of the world. If it's in the 30s, you're going to see kids walking to school in shorts. You just automatically wave to everybody. Uh, everybody just expects you to, and, and they'll wave back even if you don't know them. And we tend to like to laugh in Wisconsin. I caught myself waving to dogs. <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> When you think of Wisconsin bands, you think of uh, garbage. Garbage is uh, garbage is a car. Steve Miller, Al Jarreau. The Bodines are from Wisconsin. Hello, my name is Luke Skates. We're based out of Madison. We we've uh, toured around quite a bit for like the last four years. It's amazing when I drive across the country, how many people from Wisconsin we meet just on the road, you know, traveling from shows, and they're like, Oh my God, you guys are from Wisconsin? I'm like, yeah. A lot of people have. Told me I look like Aaron Rodgers. Mr. Rodgers called a bag, copycat. Mr. Rodgers called a bag, copycat. Aaron Rodgers is new on the field, and we're like, we had to come up with a saying for him. So I was just like, Rodgers that. And I'm like, I really need to make a t-shirt about that. My dear wife, she, she was saying that what she did was insignificant. It's just a, a t-shirt idea. But it's a thread in the whole fabric of the Packer Nation. My home is in Wisconsin, my heart is in Wisconsin. We are so uniquely different, so we'll take all the cheese head, we'll, we'll let people think that we're a little bit backward and hayseed here, then we just kind of laugh when we pick up another Super Bowl uh, trophy. Cheesehead or Wisconsinite is a friendly person, take on all comers, 
be good to the people. I live in Green Bay. I make closet cheese head. I don't wear the cheese hat, but I think I have chosen to be the cheese head. <laughs> the Green Bay Packers are the American team because of the fans. What yeah. else is there beside the Packers? I've heard that over and over again. <laughs> you know, we really feel the Packers are part of our extended family. I mean, we very much enjoy going to the games, win or lose, but you know, it's like anything, it's a lot more fun to win. You don't have to be from Wisconsin to be a cheesehead. You don't have to be from Wisconsin to be a Packer fan. You're invited to be a member of the family anytime. You know, you see somebody with a yellow chunk of foam on their head, you see somebody with, you know, some green on somewhere, and you're you're instantly connected. You know, people that have left, um, that are living in LA or New York City or whatever, I mean, it's always proud that you could say that I'm a cheesehead and you have the, the roots of where you're from and you're proud of it. It's a bond that you have with a complete stranger that, that automatically makes you a little bit closer to that person. And that goes back to the Wisconsin thing. You know, you keep it around, it works, don't, you don't need to replace it. If it's not broken, don't fix it. You know, just leave it alone. It's good enough right now and get it done, okay? You're probably trying to tell the rest of the world there's more to us than just getting naked in three degree weather, painting green and red letters on our chests, and that we've got more on top of our neck than just a, a cheese head. I'm not sure it's true. <laughs>